So this is a conflation. This talk will be, I will be addressing two different papers. And of course, it, it is not only my work, but work of uh, a group of people here that I miss here. And then I give special thanks to uh, Professor Bruce Valley who sent me some uh, nice images that I will be showing you. Um, this is the story of how I became a minus a recent stu uh, student and uh, the latest member of the AGN group. I have to learn a, a lot about uh, AGNs. Um, okay, so in this talk, I will be giving you a very brief introduction of AGNs, which I typically do not do. Uh, and then I will be speaking about symbiotic stars. Then I will go into the specially resolved structures in symbiotic stars, in particular, the only one uh, result, which is uh, our query. And then I will go into the extra properties from symbiotic stars to finally present you what we did for this CH Sydney. And then I will give you some final remarks. Um, I will not go into the details of AGN and the uh, properties that they have, uh, very likely, Alice told you a little bit of this last, in last talk. So let me just tell you that AGNs are, uh, it's a super plastic black hole, super massive black hole at the center of galaxies, which is a creating material. And there, there are several structures moving at fast or intermediate velocities. And there's a, a dust, uh, rich stories around this, all this uh, thing. And these people, the AGN people are, very advanced because they come up with a unified idea to um, explain a lot of phenomena they see in different galaxies, which learning about this, it's something that we low mass stars need. This is something that I've been learning with my X-ray studies of these symbiotic stars. So uh, this is just a nice, nice image that I took from uh, Twitter. So super massive black hole, separated material, produces, it has this um, torus-like structure, which is, a creating material onto the white of the black hole, and then produces this bipolar ejection sweep. You can study in X rays, uh, radio. Uh, you can study their uh, magnetic fields. So, so you can go into this Twitter account and take a look at the whole video. Um, actually, in the AGNs are also the brightest X ray sources. Most of the X ray satellites or missions that have that we had in the past concentrated most of the time studying AGNs. And so this is a typical uh, X-ray spectrum from an AGN. So in the X-axis I showed you, we do not use um, wavelength we, or frequency, we use energy, in particular, kilo electron volts. And the Y-axis is just a measure of uh, energy or number of, cold, of photons with the technical explosions. Uh, so these people already know that they, there are several components in the X-ray spectrum from an AGN. Um, so the red line here is the, the actual X-ray central source, which is produced by the supermassive black hole. And then there's some soft excess below one kilo electron volt, which people don't know still where it comes from, but it's very likely produced either by the jet or winds from stars in the vicinity of the black hole or anything that could be thermal excitation. And then there's this purple uh, reflection bump which is very important, and this is what I will be addressing in my talks on the symbiotic stars. So this reflection bump hump is produced by the torus or uh, material around the, the black hole that reflects the extra emission from the black hole. It produces these very nice iron lines here, which are uh, part of my talk or the key features that I want to describe for the symbiotic stars. And this is just a schematic of both whatever you see. So a lot of things come from different parts, but you, you see this integrated uh, spectrum. And of course, the unified model predicts that depending on the viewing angle, we see this, this galaxy, the properties of the galaxy are they vary. And in particular, uh, this is an image to show that, so we are increasing uh, column density. So the soft X-ray here in this part, are easily absorbed by the contribution from the, uh, the line of sight. The material easily absorbs the extra emission, but you can see all the components are there. They're just uh, multiplied by this extinction factor, but everything's there. So the same components are needed everywhere you want to study an extra emission from an AGM. And these are two typical um, X-ray spectra from the AGMs. On the left, you see um, one where 
a significant salt X-ray emission. It's very likely comes from the wind, shocks, jet. And then another one with very, I don't know, absent X-ray, soft X-ray emission. You see the iron lines about between six and seven electron volts, and then a high energy uh, pale. This is what we would like to see in every accreting objects in the universe. I just again uh, the presence of the iron lines here, which is the 6.4 is fluorescent line, and the other two are uh, the ionized, they trace the ionized uh, medium. So we need a very high energy source to produce these emission lines. Okay, so what are symbiotic stars? Symbiotic stars are anything in a binary uh, that contains a compact object that is accreted enough material from a red giant in order to produce any uh, emission at any wavelength. This is a very loose definition of a symbiotic star. Uh, and it's what it was defined in 2013. And if you think further, so the definition might include white dwarfs, black stellar black holes, and neutron stars, uh, which is very loose. And, and actually, there are some symbiotic stars with neutron stars and stellar black holes that have been detected in our galaxy. So I want to make sure. Uh, so as a result, uh, so the white dwarf or the accretion uh, object uh, produces an accretion disk, some bipolar ejection. So we can see these marvelous images. Um, this is why I study symbiotic stars, because we see these marvelous images. This is one taken with the um, HST of the Southern Crab Nebula, which is a star that is uh, accepted to be a symbiotic star, but it hasn't been confirmed to be a symbiotic star. You can see this amazing hourglass structure in the center, and then very likely to two jets expanding perpendicularly to this. So if it's a main sequence for the compact, it doesn't count as symbiotic. Anymore. No, that could be a NOVA. Because NOVAs are for the defined for main sequence of planets. Are they even S type symbiotics? Are they yeah. Planets? No, symbiotics, they do have a uh, red time. Even the A type? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. It could be rest for dying or uh, NGVs. But not in sequence time. Um, so I want to say that in this talk, whenever I say symbiotic star, I will be talking about those where the accreting object is a white dwarf, so the low mass star case. And why are these important? Because well, um, these um, white dwarfs are those the progenitors or the supernova type one when they reach the Chandra second limit. So these are uh, useful for. Understanding these objects are useful in order to uh, use them as standard candles whenever they explode as well. Um, so here we jump uh, immediately into our query, which is um, the closest known symbiotic star. And because it's the closest, it's practically, I might be wrong, the only uh, symbiotic star when we see this nebula around. Uh, so this was a 2017, uh, uh, April uh, astronomy picture of the day image combining optical uh, observations from H alpha and H real two and the Chandra X ray emission from this, this source. Um, one year later, uh, BLT image became available through this very beautiful uh, paper presented by Lee in 2018. So we see different images taken in this, through different filters, narrow band filters, H alpha and H real two, oxygen one, oxygen two, and three. So this, you can see in detail. So actually the projector does not make justice to the images that I see here in my, so I invite you to go to the, to the paper. And this is a 30 arc seconds, which is something like 0 0.03 parsecs, in fact, 200 parsecs of distance. So this is just a color uh, combined image, taking this uh, three filters, just to show you that how pretty this negative are. And in this same, same paper, these authors um, uh, found these extremely extended structures, they, which they think they're associated with the, the nebula, with the symbiotic star. Uh, but I mean, we have, we still have not, do not understand the central part. Or we don't know anything about the external parts. So I want to embarrass uh, Will Kenny right now. Um, so right now. This is the only model that has been attempted to reproduce the nebular structure of our query. 
So it was presented in 1992. I think it was an undergrad student, probably. No, it was uh, early. It was the first, the first year of my Okay, so what they did is that they produced uh, analytical calculations to, please correct me if I'm wrong, to, to produce some torus like structure, and then they inject the fast wind at 1,000 kilometers per second, and they see what they vary different parameters, and then also the viewing angle to try to reproduce these structures in this nebula. So they did a pretty good job, I can tell. Uh, on the top um, right panel, I uploaded one of these images, and they actually you can see it fits most of the extended edition. And they can fit this bowl shape towards opening towards the north and the south. What's the orbital geometry of the? The what? The, the geometry of the, uh, the orbit. Is it because I see the, the jets that are coming out are first twisted and they go up? But we don't, we, <laughs> this model, <laughs> it's not says anything about the binary or the, the jet. The binary has like 300 days periods. Okay. But you don't know the plane? Is yeah, we actually almost looking at it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this model does not take into account the amazing jet, processing jet that we are actually seeing in the, these images. Um, what do we know about the jet? So we know it's a jet because there's been lots of spectroscopic observations and we see extremely high velocity structures. This is a, an HSD image combining nitrogen 2, H alpha, and oxygen 3. Uh, so you can see amazing details. So the jet is actually, uh, is bubbly, is, is structure is cavities, which is like cavities. What is the physical scale? Uh, so the whole jet, so this is one, two, three, So this is point, point three, like point zero six parsecs. Um, okay. um, and when you overplot the Chandra images, the X-ray emission is exactly tracing this jet. So you see that the jet is definitely uh, emitting an X-ray. So it has hot um, uh, plasmas. And because the jet has like a few hundred kilometers per second, we can estimate that the, the temperature of the jet will be something like a million Kelvin degrees using the Dyson formulas from interstellar medium. And then actually the spectrum uh, suggests that there's a, a one million Kelvin degree with some means the 90% of the total flux in X-rays. And then some extra contribution from a, a higher temperature, but it's 3% of the total flux, which is one can neglect. And um, so here I will show you a gift showing the how the jets have been expanded using HSD images, multi epoch HSD images. So this is 2014, 17, and 2020. So we actually see the expansion of the jet in real life, something that I don't know if you can do in AGNs. How we don't I already drank the Kool Aid. Two thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what we did? So we went into the yes. Sorry. Uh, how other than looking at the yeah, how do you know that this is expanding? I mean, you actually have velocity data, right? Yes, I mean, there's a lot of spectroscopy tech that's in the eighties. Since the eighties, I'm still, not going into that. No, uh, so uh, I had a related question. So the the H alpha width does that also tell you about the Expansion velocities. Yeah, actually, the jet is hollow. So you can see that, that it's hollow with certain blobs moving around. But it's because of its inclined, so you can actually see the radial differences. I do not show spectra here. Huh. Sorry. Um, so what we did, we dig into the archival in the XMM Newton, and this is what we see in XMM. So XMM has a PSF of six uh, seconds here, oh, minutes. And we can actually see that X-ray emission comes from all over the puddle. It's actually very well defined or traced by the edges of the nebular emission. So, uh, uh, so this was amazing because I was sitting there from ages, for decades already, and nobody has looked at this. Even though our Aquarius has been studied for in a lot of X-ray with a lot of X-ray instruments. So this is just a comparison with uh, the Chandra 
uh, detection. So Chandra actually filters out the extended emission, and we can only see the densest regions. And this is something that it was planned by design between XMM and Chandra. This is the way that both were designed. So Chandra has a resolution of one arc second, and XMM is something about six arc second, but has a higher effective area to detect soft uh, X-ray photons. So both of the observations are complementary. That doesn't mean that we do not see, you can actually see this is a very big clump compared to the structure we see. Uh, okay, if we excise or crack the central part that is detected by Chandra, we only model the extended X-ray emission. We uh, see that the, this is a very poor X-ray spectrum if you compare it to the previous AGN. Um, there's a, a plasma of one million degrees dominating the image. So what is what we think is happening. So the jet is blowing up, the higher pressure of the jet disrupts the jet and it creates this uh, bowl shaped morphologies. So I, it took me several uh, days in order to come up with an idea how to show you this. And I come up with this simulation. <laughs> Something like the jet goes up and it's higher pressure is disrupting the bubble, right? And then it creates, it helps forming all these several bowl shaped uh, structures that we see here. So the jet is actually feeding the extended emission. That's why they, they share similar temperature properties. Um, so in this letter, so what we concluded that why was this important other than the nice image is that, so what uh, the jet feedback mechanism, which has been argued to be producing these hot bubbles or large scales of bubbles in AGNs, is actually the same thing that is happening in symbiotic stars. So, same thing, same physics, different states. So, which uh, is very nice because it, it, it means that we can use the same tools for AGNs into the symbiotic stars. This is very exciting. Uh, so, what about other uh, symbiotic stars? Um, in our galaxy, there are about 300 uh, symbiotic stars, less than that. And only about 60 of them uh, have X ray emission. Don't ask me why, but it's only 60. Uh, and these are optical images of our four examples of symbiotic stars uh, taken from the digitized sky survey in, in uh, optical bands. So you can see on the left panels, the symbiotic stars are in the middle of the images and if they're red, they're dominated by the emission from the red giant star. And on the right panels, uh, they're kind of like bluish, yellowish, so they're dominated by the emission from the white. Uh, so, I was confused about this. Observationally, what would you say is, or what would you say are characteristics that every symbiotic star displays? Because now you're saying only 20% uh, of them are X-ray sources. Yeah, so this might have uh, observational biases because previous observations of, uh, and I will go to that, of X-ray sources, were uh, produced by Rosa, which was very, um, the effective area was placed at the very extreme soft X-ray emission, but that's easily absorbed by the galaxy or the same material from the red giant. So maybe that uh, hampered the detection from other sources. So my question is more, how do you identify, since there are like 240 stars that are still called symbiotic, how are they identified? Uh, other wavelengths. Because we see so the, what is the characteristic that you ah, have? in you see in the in the blue you see spectrum from a white dwarf and then in the red you see a spectrum from a jet red giant star with uh molecules for example the uh, oxidative titanium and oxide and stuff like that and then you also see the accretion disk in the ultraviolet and so okay. you identify them by other uh, so is the accretion disk like a necessary kind yes of it's, it's a pain uh, maybe I forgot to tell to say that the accretion disk is it's always forming symbiotic stars. Um, so these are the very poor and sadly spectra of symbiotic stars uh, obtained from ROSAT, which was a um, satellite, as I mentioned before, uh, who observed the X-ray um, sky in, in very soft uh, energies. You can tell below something like below 2.4 kilo electron volts. So what they did is um, these people, after a certain amount of uh, Observations, they classify uh, different symbiotic stars by their spectra. So they define alpha, beta, and gamma type. The alpha ones are those with emission below 0.5. The beta in the, the peak is in the middle between 0.5 and 1. 
and the gamma, you can guess, it's <laughs> about one kilo electron. But then again, Rosa was uh, limited to, this, to the soft X-ray emission. But with the new generation, ah, and this is just a comparison with how the spectra of AG index. Um, with the uh, advantage of, with the uh, new generation of uh, satellites, people started noticing that some of these sources actually had high X-ray emission or hard X-ray emission. Um, uh, in particular, if they found that some of these sources might not have soft X-ray emission, but they do have hard X-ray emission and they detect the iron line. Uh, so they said that this should be the uh, delta type of stars. And in some cases, they detected like combined spectra, which they define as uh, beta, delta uh, type. Um, yeah. Uh, also, in, even though these are brighter, you can still see that the spectra are not very good, do not have very good quality, but models can were attempted. Okay, so uh, different authors started thinking that depending on the spectra that they saw, they were they were looking at different phenomena in the same uh, symbiotic stars. So they thought that alpha type stars, uh, the soft ones, were produced by nuclear burning at the surface of the white dwarfs, which right now is not very very much accepted, but it can also, so here, or it can also be produced by the accretion of the, when the material uh, jumps into the atmosphere of the white dwarf because of magnetic fields, it could also produce soft X-ray emission. Um, the beta or uh, gamma types were attributed to sources that have very likely wings or jets that the jet can interact with the red giants stars material because some of these stars have very strong uh, winds. So shocks can be produced and X-ray emission below one or 1.5 kilo electron volts can be produced. Like we see in uh, our query. And the hard X-ray emission, these hard X-ray sources, because they're highly absorbed, they are expected to be uh, produced just at the edge between the, uh, the white dwarf and the accretion disk. This is what they think is producing the extremely high uh, hard X-ray sources. And of course, after accounting for the extinction, the self-extinction and the, and the galaxy extinction, you have all of these soft emissions in some sort, and then you produce something like this. These are just models of this, this uh, scenario. And of course, the delta types are just a combination of what we see in sources. Um, okay, in X-rays, um, people I'm who are um, in, in the previous uh, like, why did would be the hardest case? Because I mean, I will think I will believe that if you are allowing to the, to the gas to shock, for instance, in the photosphere, uh -huh. that will be a shock stronger than no, because it depends on the gravity of the compass. Yes, but then here, what's the because here the gas is shot in the in the in the accretion, and there's a temperature at the surface here, and then this is in the absence of the magnetic field. So this is just the material about to be uh, consumed by the by the one white dwarf. And why this uh, that increases the temperature large more than that the gas know. falling into the that I don't know, but should be the side, right? Sorry, it, it should, should be, be the same. same. Yeah. It's just a variable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, you know. yeah. But you say, you say this is hard because the soft vector is hard. Yeah, it is highly absorbed. So it's, 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 it's just a question of the geometry. This is what I will propose at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for talking into this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so people working with uh, photon star uh, spectra in X rays. We, uh, in general, so in general, X-ray astronomers, so what we do is we have the spectra and we try to fit different models. If we know the source, we know if it's thermal or non-thermal or emission lines or shock gas or et cetera. So what we do is to, we just uh, add a component, we compare the residuals, we know that there's another missing component I need in order to flatten the residuals. So we start adding up um, components. And in particular in this, uh, I will say that Iron line was not needed in order to 
This was a stretch out of the model, but anyway. So this is just to illustrate you how we extract people to this kind of uh, fits. So there's definitely a soft component, definitely a high, um, highly extinguished component with high temperature. And then in those cases that we detect the individual iron lines, so what people classically use is that they use Gaussian fits in order to say, okay, there's a line here, there's a line here, there's a line here. But actually this, this is not physically justified. It's just, I need something to improve my model. So I will pass Gaussian fit. So mm -hmm. this is not exactly justified. Um, and another thing is that spectra do not have a right? quality. So people just use uh, solar abundances. Um, okay. So we jump directly into CH Cygni. So um, CH Cygni has been observed by almost every major X-ray emission, like all of those. Uh, it's spectra, it's a bit uh, beta delta type uh, symbiotic star. So you can actually see uh, the two components. And I, although they're spectra, you can choose spectra from almost every mission, I selected these two for a specific thing. So first of all, Again, we need a subcomponent, a part component, something that is extremely broad because they didn't want to, I don't know, make a more complex model. But this Gaussian fit is evidently not three mission lines. Yeah. So you can actually see the shape of the receivables. They stop. Um, and these outbursts did not uh, plot their different components. But I want what I want to show here is there is some um, extra mission in the between two and three uh, kilo electron volts that is missing here. You can see it also in the other one. Oh, I was going to say it's also okay. here. But because in general, the spectrum does not have a very good quality, it seems like an acceptable fit. Very likely that I squared was something like 1.7, so acceptable, something. Um, and you can also see because these are solar abundances, the emission lines do not perfectly fit in the spectrum. Um, also, um, this paper that I found after I started this whole project, uh, these authors, uh, Whitley and Coleman, were the first one to suggest that CH Sigmund had spectral properties very similar as AGNs. And they actually suggest that, so here is CH Sigmund on the top and, and three different uh, safer two galaxies. Uh, you can see, I mean, this has worse quality, but the other three are resemble what I'll show you with uh, AGNs. And they have a model that I won't discuss here because I do not agree with them. Um, but you can go ahead and take a look at the, the model. They actually suggest that all of the emission is produced by the, uh, the reflection model, which is, we, we disagree. Okay, so then again, we went into the archive. XMM and Chandra had like the highest quality uh, and the best X-ray observations of CHC. <laughs> and this is a paper we just submitted. We're in the second round of um, referee suggestions and comments, and I think it's going to be accepted soon. So these are uh, new results that I want to show you. So first of all, they were available high dispersion, high resolution uh, spectra, extra spectra of these ones. So these are two instruments on board uh, Chandra, and we can actually see for the first time <laughs> resolve the emission lines in this source. Um, we see the iron triplet on top, the two spectra seem different or look different, although it's the same source at the same time because the two instruments have different effective areas. But the red line here is the same model on the two observations. The other poker one is Armstrong. <laughs> because when it's high resolution, I need the Armstrong. <laughs> uh, so in this medium resolution spectra, you do not resolve the lines, for example. Okay. And did you use Gaussian? Uh, not here, but I was showing you. Sorry, before you, before you skip. Uh, so in the top plot there, there seems to be some structure intermediate to the fit to the ion lines. Is that real? Like here? Yeah, yeah in those troughs. I think it's real and it's another mission. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the uh, XMM Newton RGS high resolution spectra. Whenever you obtain uh, images for XMM, you also have uh, by three uh, the high resolution spectra. The thing is that high resolution spectra in X rays are only usable if the source is very bright. That's the only, um, so this source is, of course, very bright. And we detect again uh, lots of emission lines. 
and the red one, the red line is a fit. So we actually have a model to fit the, X, the um, thermal emission producing these lines. And just as a comparison, uh, these are the optical, um, these are the abundances obtained from optical spectroscopy, which are mainly tracing the red giant component in CHP uh, CP. And these are uh, models for two different instruments. So you see that our abundances, the X-ray gas is uh, the same, has the same abundances as the red giant component. So we are actually confirming that this is true. This is the physics that we see. Is that the single temperature? No, it's, it's two temperature. temperature. And also the X-ray, uh, the high resolution uh, spectra uh, can be used to estimate the multi-temperature uh, structure of the source because if we use the helium like triplets, we can use the, uh, the intensities of the different lines to estimate electron temperatures under certain uh, positions. And I present you here four uh, helium light triplets, the nitrogen six, oxygen seven, magnesium nine, and silicon 13. You can tell there's kind of like a continuum here, which is produced by the free free elements of the, the emission, but it's negligible in those. Um, and we can use the uh, ratio to produce, to estimate the temperature. So these two sources are the same as the soft X-ray emission that I will show you. And this is the hard X-ray emission that gets needed for the hard. Is that correlated with the ionization energy of the pair of ions? Didn't go that much in, in but this, this, uh, ah, yeah, yeah, it's the same plasma temperatures that we see. Uh, no, but I mean, the, the, the difference from two to four to seven. Ah, I think the, the ionized no, energy. Nitrogen. So of course this this two will come from the extended emission software one, and this is from the highly extinguished glass one. This. So spatially, we, we don't have that information, but the upper triplets will be produced in a more extended shell. Mm -hmm. So we also um, try to play with this uh, spectral fits that people have been doing for years. I have done it for other sources. And so we go in, how many um, models, how many components do I need in order to fit the whole spectrum? So <laughs> this, this is the soft one, the dotted one, the dash uh, is the next thing. So we need two components to fit the temperatures, the energies below one from uh, kilometer volt. Uh, this, this is the high energy uh, uh, component, the Gaussian that is needed for the other line. And then this other thing that we need here to fit the medium energy spectrum. This is actually, this has 65 kilonewtons. This means that statistically we cannot fit this component. So the, this fit tells us that we need something in there, but the fit is not able to tell us what it is. And actually, we get statistically as acceptable fits if we exchange that third component into a power law and then for some reflection component due to neutral gas. So we obtain statistically acceptable fits. This have the same chi square, for example. The important here is that we get to calculate the luminosity of the source. This is something that we need for a further uh, model. How do you define statistically acceptable? This sounds like How do I do that? Define statistically acceptable. Uh, build, uh, reduce chi square below two and larger than one. Larger than the one is that the model is not better than the quality of this of the like that. In fewer parameters than you have <laughs> So here, what is this thing telling us is I need two temperatures, which is exactly um the soft that I detected by the helium triplet from nitrogen and oxygen, not so heavily uh, affected, something that is helping produce also this emission, some emission lines, something else, and then the heart had heavily extended, extinguished. And of course, the Gaussian line that none of these components give me this, this emission. So um, we notice in the meantime uh, that if you take, this is the spectrum CH signal. So if you take our query, the one that I just told you before, and then you extract the spectrum, taking into account everything, extended emission, the jet, and the central source, you get this, which is exactly, almost exactly the same as CH sigma, which has less quality, you can say. You cannot resolve the emission lines, but I mean, they look, you could also say that this is also a beta delta 
had uh, seen built externals. And this included everything we see in extras. So, of course, CA Sigmi definitely includes extended emission that we are not resolving and then emission from the central source. So, what we did, what Omaira did, uh, so she took, uh, she tried to model the observations using uh, this relative transfer simula uh, simulations from Reflex, Reflex, which simulates the physical the interaction of um, X-ray photons going through plasma, and then you have some emission from out of there. Um, we varied different parameters in order to try to fit the properties of this uh, disk. So we think that the disk is, is producing this um, uh, reflection component. So we have the, the radius of the disk, the thickness, the uh, column density, and of course, as input parameters, we have the total luminosity, which we have from the previous models, and the abundance is obtained from the high resolution spectrum. And this is the result. So the results, again, they also need this soft components. So there's something there extended very likely jets, something that we do not see resolved in our spectra. These orange lines that comes from 0.2 up to 10 kilo electron volt is the reflection one. So the reflection, and it also, uh, it, okay, the reflection emits or can be detected through uh, all over the energy range. It contributes to 10% of the soft x ray emission also. It does not dominate. And then we see the high temperature, which is the same as that. And the best thing of this is that the reflection component and the high temperature, they both fit the emission, the iron emission lines. We don't need to include this artificially Gaussian fit in order to have um, the emission lines. Of course, some um, uh, details here can be uh, improved, but this is like the best we could come up and everything fits. So we use the AGN tools to reproduce the X-ray uh, properties of a symbiotic state. In the previous series, in the drawing, no, in the, in the drawing, from where are you looking? Uh, so the model is, it's, so what we did is we did a lot of models, varying a lot of parameters, and also the line of sight. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, this is the actual line uh, density of the, this, but this is the effective because of the inclination, which I don't remember. I think I did it right in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> but it needs to have certain inclination to, in order to increase, so the effective uh, how density will be this. So, the, so that current density is not, based not either phase one or, or no, it's the effective one that you have because of and then, and then the disk is, is in white. Yes. Mm -hmm. So have you looked at the variability of the line and the variability on the iron? <laughs> 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 so for years, this source has been so bright that even the, uh, the intensity of the iron lines have been uh, reported in different papers. This is just one paper that I took uh, from Mulcahy in 2007. And these are Susaku observations on top from two different instruments of all Susaku that taken at the same time. So you can just take out of one if you want. And these are the three bits of the, uh, of the emission lines. So you can see that in the top panels, the 6.4 kilo electron volt, the fluorescent line, line is um, dominating the emission from the three ions. But in the past years, in 2009, so the iron's lines dominate the emission. And then it's going back again in 2018 in the exome and observation. So the variability of the iron lines is telling us that the aggression disk is not a steady thing around this binary state, this binary object. So actually from uh, uh, this paper made in 85, you can actually compute the, using the equivalent width of the line, you can compute the column density of the this that is producing this reflection. And could it be the orbital phase? Sorry? Could it be the orbital phase? Uh, the time variability, you mean? Mm. But we, I don't know, we will need to have the same spectra in order to say there's certain billions. You have to know the exact time. Yes. If you've got to do it for orbit, what the phase is. But these are years and the, and the, the, the third period of this source is about two years or something. So this is way larger than the here. So this is. Uh, yes, but they could still be different. Right? With this observation, what we can say is that the disk is not stable. 
this is the only thing we can say so far. Uh, and of course, uh, it also means that, it's, that this is, it probably has a torus with some structures some maybe some uh, spirals or something like that. So it could be anything. So this is the only conclusion that we can draw from this, this comparison. And this is not the only case, but we see also uh, recently at digging into the uh, XMM archive, I also found that this source this is also a symbiotic star. So here in the blue line, you can see it, it was observed in 2017 because people found out that there was like an extreme um, increase in luminosity. And actually the luminosity is due to the X soft X-ray problem. And then the hard X-ray is here. And then after one year, which is the purple thing, <laughs> sorry for the color blind. So the soft X-ray emission is decreasing. The hard X-ray emission is increasing. And finally, in 2020, it, it's going down. Um, so this observation suggests that also the eruption of jets or winds or whatever produces the soft shock X-ray emission has some effects on the stability of the case. This is something that I just um, thought about this morning. This is slide that I had <laughs> this morning. Sorry, I just landed yesterday. Uh, but this is something that we we are currently analyzing and we, I will say, we don't know what's happening here. And uh, I don't know if this is an effect that is serving AGMs, for example. So what have we learned? Just to finish the talk, um, we learned that the physics behind the production of extra emission in symbiotic star is exactly the same as AGMs. It's exactly the same. Um, it's very likely that this, the spectra, the X-ray spectra includes uh, like everything, jets, shocks, the central engine, everything, something like our aquarium. Um, ah, okay, here, the reflection is the main uh, uh, producer of the iron line. So this is what we have demonstrated. We don't need to include these Gaussians in order to fix them. And um, this work uh, just uh, gave me some questions that I've been uh, trying to think or discuss, for example. Um, can we explain uh, the different X-ray properties or this different spectra by assuming that there's a unified model similar as AGN, but only because I'm looking in this direction, which the extinction would be higher or, I don't know, something like that. It, it might depend on the view. I think I inverted this too. Uh, can we create a unified model of uh, symbiotic stars? Why only 60 uh, of 300 are X-ray detected? This is something that I still don't know. Um, do the spectra change in our time? Um, because some of them do. Uh, are some sources more active than others? Like the, the equivalent of uh, AGNs are active or not active. So we still, all of these things don't know. And I think this, um, it's a great opportunity to start working with Omaira, which is also an excellent scientist. Uh, and also, what's the relation or what's the production of soft X-ray emission producing jets or wings? Why do they modify the structure of the disk, the accretion disk? So this is something that I just, as I told you, I thought about it in the morning. And I think that's it. Thank you. We'll start with questions in the auditorium. Uh, in the meantime, the so people on Zoom can also raise their hands. That'd be great. Uh, okay, so I'll have you have first. Okay. So, two questions. Um, you told me that uh, if, the, if the, the companion is not a giant, red giant, but a main superstar, you don't call it a. a but is there something fundamental that, that may change if it's a... a, a yeah, well, well, I kept us talking. I thought it's because the closeness or the, the radius of the giant star is close to the accretion component because accretion has to be uh, continuous. Mm -hmm. And in other, uh, it, it depends on the orbit probably. So that's why in orbit we only see like explosions once in a while. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the, the accretion disk is active all the time. So I, I guess it, has to be with that, but I, I don't know. Sure. And also the low surface gravity probably of the red giants compared to main sequence. Yeah, but they're so effectively close. Yeah. So I think it has to be good. Okay. The other question is uh, so you you said that the, the AGN spectra looks similar to this thing, but 
I understand that it was only for the alpha delta types, me? Or you have in the AGN case also the four AGNs by themselves, they don't emit the X-rays. But you don't didn't you say that you have similar spectrum? AGNs, no. Well, if I said that, I'm, I'm wrong. AGN stars, which have the <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> he just learned that yesterday. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So okay. So can you put the the, the images? Uh, uh, the, the, the four types of. Uh, uh, you you have on the right pan that one. Uh, so uh, I imagine that some of them are genes and others are single big stars. The only one single big is in the top. Okay. So this is alpha delta, isn't it? Yes. Do you have Beta, the other yeah. types in the case of the AGN? Do you have the other types or, or only this one? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh my we God. have the other type, yes. So, like, and so? Yeah, we have also soft uh, energies. Yeah. You have the four types then. And also, I will say this is like a. This is a matter of uh, curation along the light of sight for us. For us. For AGN. But this, this was really fun because uh, the way they look at the spectrum is totally different the way they, that we look at the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So we approach in a different way. And so I have learned things from, from his side and he has learned things from my side. Okay, because it's, if it's the same phenomenon, then in my opinion, the accretion shock thing should be discarded because this is not going to that is not something to I don't like the accretion in, shock. In the, in the AGM. I mean, if it goes into the black hole, you don't, you just don't see the accretion right, shock. Right. I don't like the accretion shock. Uh, what I think it's, it's it, it, we are detecting is extended X-ray emission due to jets or a, a hot bubble. Why I don't have it here? Well, it's just the kinetic energy of the disk that is being dissipated close to, uh, yeah. you know, in, in the case of AGMs, close to the black hole or where the short term radio is three to six. But here it's the same thing that must be producing the X-ray. Yeah, I don't like this idea. I don't like this idea, but it's been proposed for magnetically active white dwarfs because the, uh, I mean, the creation rate is not onto the star, but depends on the configuration of the magnetic field. This is why I think this has been proposed. But what I think soft X-ray emissions coming from these sources is from jets or hot bubbles around. Which will work also in the case of the agents. This is, this is why I said that uh, our query looks more like. In the case of Belgium, it's more complex because it could also be the host galaxy. If it's mm -hmm. faint enough, the host galaxy is contributing also to some extra other options. Okay, we'll move on. Yeah. Okay. So, when I mentioned variability, I uh, went pretty quickly, but what I wanted to see is if, uh, if it's correlated with the iron line variability and the variability. Of this excess that you see in the middle because it's the same component. Uh, I actually tried to do that, uh, but there's no correlation between the. Um, it should be because it's coming from the same. There's not. Well, I mean, I don't know. Know. it should be. Like, I don't know. There's no. I mean, I tried to correlate the, the same extension. Extension. You just uh, like this to me. It's <laughs> the only. It, it seems like it's higher here. <laughs> than that, that's but okay. it's not, variability uh, of individual components is fine, but. They should be correlated. That's all. That's the point. But it's not. Then it's not the same. You, you've only got two or three epochs, so you can't yeah, say yeah, much plus from like hundred. That's so crazy. Crazy. You can't really. You can't build a correlation. From here, here, we can only so say once. Yeah. So here's only as five epochs, right? Yeah. So from here, I can only say that whatever is produced in the fluorescent line yeah. is not the same in the, this observations. This is the only thing we can say with this evidence. Okay, well, I agree with you that it should be correlated because of this equation. Fine. Okay, second is, uh, well, I, I, it's, you know, for me, it's a weird sort of coordinate. You see D and D rather than E squared D and D. No, no. So I couldn't see how it would, uh, uh, you know, uh, be similar to the AGN spectra that we see, where we see a thermal bump in a, and, you know, emission from the corona in the AGN, which is the X ray component. Is that the same thing happening? What's I'm trying to understand the similarity between the AGN and your system. Yeah, what they call corona in AGNs is actually the soft X-ray part, which I think it comes from the... That's the compromised emission. Is this the compromised emission or this is not? The X-ray 
the high energy bump that you see. Ah, the, the high energy bump. Yeah, that's that's a highly extinguished. Uh, ah, so the I think the model is actually the model it's, uh, what is that? The central star is also as a power law. Yeah. Now, what is the physical origin of this bump? In the in the yes. in, in these sources. Yeah. Well, this is a question for you. Yeah, it's a reflection. <laughs> <laughs> it's a reflection. <laughs> it's a reflection. But it's open scattered. It is it is compromised no, into the context. You know, the, 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 this, this is too there too well. So this is everything is thermal, thermal, this is thermal, this is reflection. Yeah. So we don't have to compromise compensation like so it's not similar to ADM. Well, that's because the, the center effect. source is a supermassive black hole and emits differently as a white dwarf. But that's why I was uh, saying that it was fun because if I look at this spectrum, I believe it's an alien, what I would do is to uh, use a power law and a very absorbed power law mm. uh, because I think it's conformation from, from this corona. Yeah. But uh, they, what they do is to fit with a highly ionized uh, thermal medium because they, they know it is not contaminized, it's a highly ionized medium. And they can naturally fit the highly ionized lines. If you go to the next slide, I believe, uh, you can see that this thermal, highly obscure emission is what is uh, producing the, the, uh, the yeah. blue, uh, uh, highly ionized lines. Mm. While what they do is to just add a line because they need an, an extra line to fit the 6.4 uh, kV emission line. What we do is the opposite. We have a continuum and this iron key alpha emission line very well fitted with the reflection component, but then we add a Gaussian lines, lines to add to fit the ionized lines. What I have learned now is that I need this highly ionized medium, probably in Indian, but nobody has explored that because in, in Indian, what we do is to add lines there, and we don't care about. So this is the component. And they do the opposite. They care a lot yeah. about these yeah. higher ionized lines, but they add a line to the, the neutral one, to the iron health. So we both are doing something not very good. And now that we understand each other, I think we can do better. <laughs> okay, very brief last question. You, you mentioned only you, you see some fraction of these uh, X-ray bright sources. Is that the X-ray emission that's missing? Uh -huh. 60 of 300. And the X-ray emission you associated to these jet-like features, correct? For the soft source, sources. Is that what's missing? You, you don't see? What, what I would say yes, because right. those previous observations made. No, no, no. In the Rosen era, they, they were supposed to detect soft X-ray emission. And they were not detecting the hard X-ray emission. You said there's a big sample out of which you see a small fraction. What were you referring to? 300 versus um, 60. 60. Yes, what were you referring to? What's yeah, which component is yeah, the no, detection? Any x ray detection? No x ray detection. These are 60 sources that were detected in x rays, regardless if they were alpha, beta, delta, gamma. Sure, but the others don't have it. The others don't have, have it. it. There is, no, so you have 60 with x rays. With x rays. So and for some reason in the remaining, there is no, uh, the x rays are coming with from these jet like features, correct? There's no detection in the other sources. The not in the one that you're detecting. The X-ray, where are the ones? Yes. No, some of these are uh, delta, some of these are gamma. Some so of these are rosa, right? Yes. So yeah. below like uh, two kilos. Uh -huh. I'm just trying to see if there is, a, there is a, you know, we don't understand how the jets are launched in these. Yeah. Right. So there is some sort of Edding, you know, Eddington efficiency. Uh, these are beyond them. The other ones are not probably. Uh, yeah, and that's also what, Rosa, to... what it, it did is a whole scary survey. The observations were like 300 kilo, uh, seconds of deep, so they were not deep. So it doesn't mean it. It's just, it just means that sources that you detected are the brightest. Well, yeah. I'm trying to get to the point that you're, you're relating it to the uh, inclination angle. That's one way of probably yeah. thinking about this why you see in some and why, why you don't see in some. The other would be the efficiency of launching yes, these of course. That's what I said, how uh, effective are these sources using. I wanted to see apologies because they're more distant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about Irosita? Uh, Irosita will be like eight XMM Newtons connected. So we would very likely detect more stars. So in the, in the last uh, object that you showed, 
I know that you only saw this one. So, so would you say that this change type from alpha delta to no, 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 because you can see the whole uh, emission down to point two. So the, the classification is the same. So it only means that the components are like firing. And then you, you, the way you, you said it is, this is what's changing first, the surface ray, and it's somehow having an effect on the disk. So we, why, why in that direction and not the other way? Why, yeah, yeah, yeah. It that, like that comes with, uh, we don't know the launching mechanism. So uh, it's only, it only means that it's related with the pressure disk. Yeah. That's the only thing. It's, but it's my point is how the soft x rays vary fast. If the soft x rays come from very extended uh, emission in the home okay. problem, how can they vary on the time scale of years? So the emissivity produces because the volume uh, is larger. The, the expansion time scale of the alpha nebula is hundreds of years. I, I, yeah, I, I actually did this factor before going on vacation. <laughs> and I don't remember that. I actually don't think I didn't even send it to my Oh, yes. Okay. Um, when you mentioned about the variability of the lines, that reminds me of another white bar. This is a cool white bar, uh, where also variability has been spotted in emission lines, in this case, the tensor. And later, those authors propose that there is also an embedded body within the disk that maybe will be contributed to the, the variability of the lines. So, do you think that would be happening here that there is an embedded body within the disk that also can or can help you to explain this something else component that you mentioned? I don't think so, because here if we are creating the wind from the red component, so the red component does not have like. Bodies in the swing. Good lunch. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and actually, the line we can reproduce is by reflection. So in, it's absorption in that case because the body is colder than the wind. Mm -hmm. But here is reflection, and this is actually a fluorescent line. It can only be produced by reflection. Uh, I'm retired. <laughs> okay, I'll okay. check if uh, there are any questions on Zoom. Anyone? Bueller? No, uh, in that case, one more question from the audience, perhaps? Well, I, I will ask. <laughs> for, no, for. So, uh, yeah, I, I sort of, I take your point, there seems to be a, a broad analogy between the Murphy's stars and AGMs. There are differences in how the jet looks, though. You see in the AGMs, you see, you see a sort of working surface and you see a cocoon around that. And here, you only see the jet close to the source. You don't seem to see a far working surface. And then you see this, this hot bubble, uh -huh. but there's no sort of feature in the hot bubble that you can associate with the working surface of the jet. The jet is well contained within the hot bubble. But actually, I don't show it here because this work in progress from NASA people, but they have multi uh, epoch observations with Chandra, and they can actually see also the jet expanding and the hot bubble expanding within the jet. Uh -huh. So it's actually also phrasing. But on the scale of the outer nebula, do you see any evidence of a uh, some sort of uh, bipolarity there that's along the axis of the jet. Ah, no. I mean, the nebula is very faint, yeah. on larger scales. But you did see the sort of the top in the. Yeah, but that was figure. produced with a 30 inches telescope on one week observation. But you do see so. Yeah. Of... Well, here it, it, it looks like the system is quite variable in terms of its information. Mm -hmm. That's why you see but these new features and that. you dissipate. The working surface becomes much broader because you're dissipating energy in all sorts of directions. And in the agent, is much more common. Yes. Last question. Is there any idea of uh, if you some, somehow shut down the, the accretion mechanism, how long the, the jet will still look like a jet and, and the extended emission also? How, no. how long it will take to fade out? It's a simulation. It's a simulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You need this. Me? I'm like a 70 year period. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. No. Uh -huh. For the orbit. Yes. Uh -huh. the and that's yeah. related to the outburst of the jet. Is that right? I don't know. I have a comment and question, both very quick. <laughs> comment is, the last one. 
I don't want to I get the most. Uh, uh, the comment is you people are all wrong. The plural of AGN is AGN. Uh, the, the question was what's the furthest? So I saw that there was an SMC source in there. What's the furthest that you have spectra in the X ray for uh, uh, symbiotic stars? Yeah, there are sources in there, my yeah, but um, yeah, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Excellent. So it's been a very engaging discussion, a lot of heckling. So let's thank the speaker again. See everyone uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you.